Okay, um, I'm Sucheta Connolly. I'm here from University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I'm actually the director of the Pediatric Stress and Anxiety Clinic at University of Illinois at Chicago. And I've really been in the anxiety field now for the last 15 years or so. I, I've been at U of I since 1992, but have really specialized in anxiety disorders for some years. And I was one of the uh, principal authors of the practice parameter through the American Academy. And so um, I'm going to cover that a little bit initially, but want you to know that I'm thinking about that as you develop some of the guidelines here and how we can update those and modify those to make sense with what you're dealing with here in Florida. Okay. Um, just want to, you know, tell you that I, I don't have any drug company affiliations. I am involved on an NIH grant right now um, at our site where we're, we're looking at uh, brain markers as well as I'm involved in a medication part of that study. The reason I've listed all these medications is we don't have any medications right now that are FDA approved for use in children and adolescents. Um, that's because we continue to need more studies, but I will show you today that we have a lot of medications that have shown very good efficacy. Um, okay, and then in terms of what I'm gonna cover today, I'll be talking about the practice parameter. I'll also cover some symptoms of anxiety disorders. I'm not going to cover everything that's in this PowerPoint that you've gotten. I just don't have time, but I've tried to give you some slides in the first half that I will go through very quickly, and then I'm going to try to move to the part that's relevant today, which is the medications and treatment um, for childhood anxiety disorders, and then developing some of the recommendations. So the first half of this I'll move through fairly quickly. Um, okay, I just wanted to tell you what, what actually is in the abstract at the, at the American Academy, uh, the, the practice parameter. The things that were emphasized there, I've given you several slides on this uh, in your handout, is that we want to focus on the fact that children and adolescents are under-identified in terms of anxiety disorders, underdiagnosed, and aren't able to receive the treatment that they need in many communities throughout the country. So the first step is really identifying that the anxiety disorder exists. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Then the second piece is that we have evidence-based treatments that we know work. Cognitive behavioral therapy and the serotonin medications, we know our efficacy, you know, there's efficacy for those. And so that's part of what we wanna to emphasize to the community, that there are treatments that work and help these kids. So this, uh, again, just helps you understand how the practice parameters were written. Um, again, they're emphasizing screening, emphasizing examining comorbidity. Another piece that becomes important is that at the first level of assessment, we need to look at not only the severity of the symptoms, but also impairment. A lot of times we talk about rating symptoms, but we don't think about how impairing is that to the child. With children and adolescents, they may not meet full criteria for a disorder, but we really need to think about if the child is impaired and those symptoms are impairing, we need to initiate treatment. We don't need to wait till we can fully diagnose it, okay? That's a very important piece with anxiety disorders. Uh, the other thing that they talked about uh, were the comorbid conditions being very important. And something I'll talk about a little later uh, when we look at uh, the treatments is we want to emphasize that even if CBT is not available in the community, let's say you don't have a provider you can refer to in your community, at a minimum, you need to at least inform the family, inform the child about cognitive behavioral therapy, how it works. At the end of my talk, you'll find in my list of references, I've given you books that uh, you can purchase for your center, families can purchase, they're readily available on the internet. I will also be giving, along with my talk, I'll be sending to Marie, sent some things already, some PDFs, which you can use and that community folks can hand out to their patients as a point of uh, helping them understand what is CBT and how does it work. Just because you can't provide that service yourself doesn't mean that you can't educate people about that. Okay. All right, so it's very common. I'm, I'm again, I'm not gonna review all these slides in detail, but I want you to know that um, we just, with these treatments available, uh, we want to, to get the word out. Anxiety disorders are highly prevalent, as I mentioned here, eight to 10%, up to 20% once you reach adulthood of lifetime prevalence. 
Um, and also in preschool, this is important, we appreciate this, lots of studies have been done now, epidemiologic studies, and what we're finding is that preschoolers have, have anxiety disorders, they can present exactly the same, and some preschoolers, what happens is some of the symptoms aren't quite as fully developed as they are in children. Um, they may just talk about a vague sense of they're uncomfortable, they're scared, or they may present in an angry, irritable fashion as well and they may be crying and having tantrums, but we find that they also have anxiety disorders, and we need to try to identify these as early as we can. One of the things that this slide is trying to show, though, is that it's not that all children who have, um, a, let's say, behaviorally inhibited temperament or all children who manifest these symptoms are going to go on to have anxiety disorders. So um, we see that there's a genetic piece, but we also see that there's an environmental piece when it comes to anxiety disorders. Um, and so these are some of the other risk factors. What I wanted to emphasize here is that yes, we have the biologic risk factors. You can inherit uh, you know, anxiety disorders. You can have a behaviorally inhibited temperament that puts you at greater risk. Not that necessarily you're gonna have it, but you're at greater risk. But then we have the environment. It's a double whammy if your parent has an anxiety disorder because one, there's a genetic piece, but two, there's that modeling that they're doing at home when they're facing anxiety provoking situations or the child is in a situation that they feel scared and worried and they say don't do that or you know you're going to hurt yourself that in and of itself models a type of coping skill that then influences how the child learns to cope with new situations and challenging situations so we need to put a lot of work along with this thinking about individual CBT the parent needs to be involved in this process and we need to identify fairly quickly if the parent's anxiety is severe enough that it's going to interfere with the child really being able to engage in the treatment process and make changes. And then protective factors have a lot to do with our innate abilities, but also coping skills, again, that we learn in the family, social supports that we have. People are taking a look at all these things. These are some of the common co-occurring disorders. I want to emphasize the top three, ADHD, 30% both ways. 30% of kids with ADHD have anxiety. 30% of, uh, of folks with anxiety have ADHD. Depression, the older you get, the more likely you are to have comorbid depression with your anxiety, particularly if the anxiety disorder is untreated. That risk gets greater and greater the older you get. Um, people do feel that onset of anxiety precedes onset of depression in childhood. Um, substance abuse, again, as you get into adolescence, untreated anxiety puts you at greater risk. We'll be talking about substance abuse a little bit in the comorbid disorders later. Social anxiety in particular is one that can uh, predispose adults as well as children to uh, substance abuse, but certainly it's present with all of them. And then I've listed some other things here. These are things we typically see in our clinic. Uh, we have kids who have comorbid PDD you know, Asperger's and other spectrum disorders, um, reactive attachment disorder, certainly anxiety is often a component. I put learning and language disorders. We need to identify early if a child has these kinds of developmental struggles that may indeed lead them to be anxious in the school setting, in various settings where they're asked to perform a task, they're finding that task challenging, that in and of itself can make them look very anxious. And we want to identify the etiology of that anxiety if it's something other than anxiety itself. You know, if it's a learning problem, a language disorder, something else we can help them to work on in their life. Um, ODD, not so common with anxiety, but, but does present itself. The reason I put this up is, it's very easy for people to assume that an anxious child is ODD because they're not listening to their parent, they're not doing the things the parent is asking them to do because they're so engaged in trying to uh, avoid the anxiety provoking stimulus. And they may have tantrums, they may be screaming, they may be biting, they may be kicking, but we need to understand what's the etiology of that, where is that coming from? So that's an important part of the assessment process. With bipolar disorder, most kids with bipolar um, will manifest anxiety symptoms, and many of them will have an anxiety disorder, but vice versa is not the case. Most children with anxiety will not have bipolar. So that becomes a, a comorbidity, and we'll talk about that. That's challenging to treat. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to emphasize with assessment is in terms of screening and assessment, 
we want to use tools that exist. One, some of the PDFs I'll be sending out to Marie as well for community providers to use are measures we have that are free, available on the internet. Now I've mentioned the BASC and CBCL here. Those are, BASC is commonly used in the school setting. These are broadband measures. For, for symptoms in general, but then we do have the Vanderbilt, which is free. We have the pediatric symptom checklist, which is free. A lot of pediatricians already are using that. These are measures that help us screen early for uh, anxiety disorders, I encourage clinicians to use those. Then if we're looking at measures that we can use for anxiety itself, we have the mask and the scared. The scared is also available. So I, the ones that are free and available, I will be forwarding those to Marie so that will be on, available for providers to use those. Um, one of the things with anxiety disorders that we need to stress is that if we only tap one source of information, we're not as likely to identify it. So we need to ask the parents, we need to ask the child, and we also feel it's important to ask the teacher. For those families that allow that, again, uh, the forms can be sent to the teacher. The Vanderbilt has a teacher scale that can go out to the teacher. And so with the comorbid disorders, I just mentioned some of the measures that are helpful, the CDI, uh, people are familiar with that, Connors is another one, as well as the Vanderbilt for the ADHD. And then substance abuse, I've also given you that in your handout itself, is the CRAFT, is a great screening tool that's well validated. And so I've put that in the handout, it's just several questions you can ask during the assessment, you're doing a good screening for substance abuse then in, in the population. Um, I, I put these slides in, you know, you're probably familiar with T-scores, but it's not that hard to read these measures. They all follow the T-scores, so 65 to 70 is what we consider uh, relevant, clinically relevant. And the higher you go, you know, the more clinically uh, impaired the child is likely to be. The reason I mention this is these things can be done by somebody in the office. Clinicians don't need to give these measures. An office staff member can do this. It's very easy to do. You can have this information before you see the child. That will help you focus on various areas already based on the child and parent report. When you don't have a lot of time, it helps to know what are some things the child and also the teacher and parent are already identifying as problematic. And again, I emphasize you, you, know, you don't need to be a clinical person to uh, read those things. This is the craft. Again, I've given that to you in your handout. It's, I think you're almost already familiar with this, but I think it's important that, that people have that available. 